three, two, one. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining for today's live interview um, on History Live. Today, I have the honor of speaking to a very special guest indeed. She lives in one of the most iconic stately homes um, in the UK called High. In the world, hang on, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most stately houses in the world um, called High Clear Castle, but some of you may know it better as Downton Abbey. Um, Lady Carnarvon is a historian as well as a New York Times best-selling author. And she is here today to speak to us about her life, about the discovery of Tutankhamun, her books um, on the real Downton Abbey, and much more. So Lady Carnarvon, thank you so much for joining. Pleasure. <laughs> it's great Pleasure. to have you. I hope everyone's keeping warm. Well, yes, we wear more clothes here. <laughs> we wear layers of clothes. There's not a lot of heating. <laughs> So it's uh, your, your wedding anniversary in a couple days with the Earl, George. Um, do you have anything special planned? <laughs> oh, a huge party, of course. No, <laughs> no, I think uh, I was wondering whether I would, might get a takeaway rather than cook again. But that was about it. <laughs> but no, it's not often we go away. It's a lovely time to go away to visit somewhere else. But but we're here, we're together, we're very grateful for, for what we have and, you know, for the hard work and, you know, for going forward. So, so no, I just think I, I thought I'm, I've actually ordered him a few little presents. Okay. Which, <laughs> so I've done that and I just thought it'd be very nice to perhaps take some time out, go for a walk, take a thermos flask of coffee yes. and go and find an amazing view. I think views and horizons are really useful in this particularly challenging time. So I thought that might be a plan. It's important to connect to nature. So I think that's a, a nice way to celebrate a wedding anniversary. I, I always want to start these interviews by finding out a little bit more about um, the, the person I'm interviewing a little bit more personal. So I, I know you grew up with six sisters. Yep. How was that? Well, it was and still is amazing. and. Um, you know, the six of us, there, I'm, I'm one of six, I have five sisters, if you like, but you're quite right, there are six of us, and um, we are, we remain very close, love each other to bits, and are always there for each other. Yeah, yeah. And who was the favourite? No favourite. My mother always said, because sadly my parents, our parents died quite young, and my mother always said that um, she loved us all equally, and it's always a good thing to say out loud. I think not everybody says enough out loud. And they always told us how much they loved us. So, and that you, you, that you could only try to do your best and that's what you should do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, so how, how is the lockdown affecting everybody at, at High Clear? I'm, I'm sure it must be a very quiet uh, experience and strange experience there at the moment. Well, it's not strange so much as anxious making, scary, frightening, worrying. You know, we're a hospitality business, we're a heritage business. We survive by welcoming visitors, making them feel welcome, giving, creating different experiences, tours, um, afternoon teas, suppers, themes, stories, anecdotes, walks in the country, all those sorts of things, which is the one thing we can't do. So for every, like every other, hospitality or heritage business it is a deeply challenging time and it's been a very challenging year and I'm quite sure that by the end of this next lockdown there will be very there will be fewer houses and businesses left yeah, yeah. well I, I'm sure that uh, High Clear will will continue um, it's been awesome. well I hope so I mean you have to keep trying you we we do different virtual you know I've build up my Instagram in order to share what's happening. We're all walking together through this virus. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live or anything else. Whatever you do, you need to take the same precautions and have the same um, sense of community as everybody else. 
and we will all get through it. It's just that horizon is slightly harder to see and we're not going to go back to where it was, but hopefully we can create a turning point and find a way to live where we can create the businesses again, which creates the employment, the happiness, the money and the income. Yes, yes. And, you know, bringing, bringing the people in to, to experience part of the heritage and the history Definitely. I think it gives people an anchor. Yeah, I think looking back and having the visible houses and history, which High Clear and other stately homes has, it, it gives you um, an anchor in the world. So I think that's important. And it certainly helps me when I go around and I find an amazing oak tree, which I know is about 400 years old. So it was there when Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne and it's sort of slightly retreating into the stag's heads at the top of it, but it's doing well and it's coping with what's being thrown at it. And it's overcome attacks from the environment and viruses in its own way. And, and it's observing things like that, enjoying things like that, going for walks, taking exercise, you know, the laughter, the people's expressions, which is more easy to see outside. So I, I think these houses, the parks, the landscape, the woods, the walks, the, the camaraderie you establish with the guides is, is very important. And I, I'm looking forward, I hope to be able to step forward with caution, you know, when we can. Yes, yes. But you, you mentioned going out um, in nature to going for walks and things like that but you actually led a very interesting life before you even arrived at Highclere, um, living in Germany, exploring Scotland. I know you like hiking and fishing. Um, do you enjoy <laughs> experiencing these kinds of different parts of other people's cultures? Well, I'm, I'm partly Scottish, so I would regard that still as my culture and heritage. But we grew up in London and Cornwall, so we had a, an amazing childhood of just you know, running around, collecting mussels off the beach, going for full walks, always back in time for lunch or supper or whatever time our mother had set. <laughs> so in that way, the holidays were idyllic and Maureen and Blyton, I suppose, and very precious for that. And I was lucky enough to go to an amazing school in London, which taught the value of reading intensively and extensively and the idea of collecting your thoughts and organising them and presenting them. And so I took that forward to university and then I trained as a chartered accountant. And I've been very grateful for that training, not because of the accountancy so much, but in terms of the training that accountancy gives you to plan, to read what happened last year on the audit, to plan what you're going to do, to process it, to continually check your processes, to present it, you've got a budget and you've got a deadline. And that process there has, I think, been invaluable to, invaluable to me. And that's what I've used, I think, during this pandemic, most of all, yeah. that ap application of um, thoughts to action yeah. to project completion. And it, it must have, having the, the chartered accountant history um, with you, it, it must have helped running high clear, I'm sure. Well, my husband's brilliant at the finances and I do more of the marketing and perhaps more on the, hum on the human resources side, but it, it does, because you don't want to be a busy fool. There's no point working really hard and not making any profits because you can't put that back. So I'm all about marginal contribution. So it teaches you about sales are vanity, profits are sanity. So I'm always interested in what's really there. And then I'm interested in what everybody else wants. So that's what's amazing about Instagram, because you can understand what other people want. I'm not going to tell them what they might want or I think they want. It's what they want. So that's what's fascinating. It's the empathy and engagement. So I, I really enjoy some of the spirit of Instagram and the social media, which I hope Highclear takes as perhaps it was designed or the vision of some of the people who began it all. Yeah, yeah, sharing. Exactly, sharing. And you, you've got your blog now and your podcasts. So I think you're-, you're I'm busy. <laughs> busy and, in, and, in, and engaging with, with people, which I think will, will open up a whole new world for Highclere. You know, I think well, high houses are about people, not just the stones. Yes. So it's about people. You know, what matters is not where my sisters live, but matters about them. 
you know so it's the same it, it matters it's the guides who work here we have 40 to 50 part-time guides who work at high clear in the summer it's quite you know there's probably a, there would normally be about a hundred full and part-time people working here on any day and of the guides it's you know they're in their 70s our oldest employee is 95 or 94 so we go from all ages from the 16 year olds who are getting their first job which is very important to the older people it's they make their choices with how they do it and we provide and we'll continue to provide really safe environments we've got the space which is what we use and we've got all the precautions so i hope that we can continue to provide a safe environment going forward and allow people to come out and feel a bit better about life and themselves and have a laugh exactly, I've missed that bit. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but as as uh, you and i lady carnarvon we are we are both lovers of history yeah is there a particular area in history that fascinates you don't so, know. I, I started um, my first history book, if you like, was Almina. Well, I've written some guidebooks and books on Egypt. But that was, you know, I was looking at the Downton Abbey period from 1895 to 1923, when her husband died, having discovered, discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. So I love that book. It was very clear. It was the exuberance, the extraordinary house parties and life before the First World War. The amazing hospital that Almina created here during First World War, when she gave all her money, her life, her time, everything, mm -hmm. to the fundamental project of saving people's lives. She was the most amazing nurse, and few people died despite the lack of antibiotics. She was a stickler for cleanliness, for talking to the patients, for reading with them, making them feel better. And she spent a huge fortune on that. So that, in a sense, has been where I've taken much of what we've done from, because there's no greater gift. Yeah. And then after the end of the First World War, that book took me on to the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, and her husband swung back in to lead the story as well. And then, of course, his death. So I, I've loved the book because of an extraordinary woman in the middle of it who did yeah. so much. Yeah. And then after that, I wrote the next book about her daughter-in-law, my husband's grandmother, mm -hmm. beginning with the death of Tutankhamun, uh, the, of, the, of Lord Carnarvon having discovered Tutankhamun, but from his son's point of view. So looking at these different discoveries, pulling out the different stories, and then thinking that that generation had survived World War I, were living through the 20s and the 30s, mm -hmm. and then falling over the precipice into the catastrophe of World War II. So again, it's I think it's looking back at history, understanding it, looking at some of the turning points, perhaps, and just contemplating them in our own lives today. So I, I am a passionate historian, so I've looked at that. I, I go back in time to William of Wickham, who lived here from, his dates were, um, for 1324 to 1404, so 14th century man. This was a palace in those days. So I swing from medieval to Victorian to more modern times, and then of course back to ancient Egypt. Yeah, yeah. But with, with Lady Almina, she was such an amazing woman. She as was. She was converting part of the house to- No, the whole house was converted to a hospital. A hospital. It was a proper, working hospital she had an operating theater she employed the best surgeons they'd come down by train to operate on a monday she had visiting days she employed 30 nurses she had a doctor on hand they had the most comfortable bedrooms because she felt if they were well looked after they had a good tot of whiskey <laughs> um, they had good food they'd get better sooner and you know what she's right if you make people feel better and give them that and and she did. And then I've got I've got 400 letters from them, from their parents. And that's what I wrote the book around. So it was a different way of looking at history. And again, it's people centric as ever, not just black and white reform acts on a page. That's not me. Yeah, it, it had it had some 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 soul in it was, I think, mm, that's so. important. Yeah. But with Lady Almina, as you said, now she converted the whole house into the hospital. Mm saw something similar happen in Downton Abbey, 
Did that? Yes, it was. It was used again as a turning point in the story. <laughs> did, did that have an influence on when they were writing Downton Abbey? I think it might have done because when Julian Fellows wrote the first episode, he didn't know whether it'd be commissioned for another one. So um, for the first series of six episodes, was it? I think it was six. You don't know. And then suddenly the whole thing began to somersault forward and people wanted to watch it. A costume drama, which began with a Titanic sank. Who would have guessed? So then it somersaulted forward. And but he's a great script writer. It's, you know, I wouldn't dream of, you know, he, it's his inspiration. Yeah. Uh, but he knew some of the stories and it kind of works because then it gives down to Navi a reality mm -hmm. and again an anchor. And for all of us, wherever we walk, whatever journeys our life takes us on, we all need a few anchors. Yeah, yeah. But Downton Abbey was, was a worldwide phenomenon. How did it come to being filmed at High Care? Did Julian Fellows call you up and just say, hey, I want to make this, this show at your, at your home? No, no, well, I, I had, well, you know, I, part of everyday life is I had then, my parents' law didn't live in the castle. But I thought it's a stately home and the word home makes the difference because it gives it a life. They were built as homes. So from time to time, we welcome friends for weekends. And I know Julian Emmerfellers and they've quite often stayed with us. So he knows how the house works. He, so you get that sense of a, of a knowledge from that of a friend staying. So I think that makes a big difference to, um, to how he wrote it. And I'd heard from his um, wife, Emma, who's just a great woman, that something's up, something's up, and you kind of think something's on the air. And, and they thought it would be a great, um, anyway, they came and thought they'd found the perfect house, the location company, the filming company. And then they thought they couldn't have found it first off. So they went and looked at 400 other houses and then ended up with us. So we didn't know it would be so important, did we? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a, I don't think there was a, a better house, a better home to have recorded Downton Abbey at. Well, it's got good geography for the TV because everyone thinks they know it. Yeah. Because of the geography of the rooms from the central saloon. So it's um, back to geography again, really. <laughs> so you, you married the, the Earl in 1999 and uh, only a few years later, mm -hmm. you, you and the Earl had to take on the responsibilities of managing the the estate and the household how how was that did you have to then immediately learn as much as you could about the history of Highclere well you don't really plan in that way I'd married a lovely man he already um, um, was involved in a lot of the estate and the farm so I had married a farmer and he was also involved in software and communication companies in London. So we lived between the two. And then, and then as time went on, it was, we turned our attentions more and more as we began to get our knees under the table and to take on our tenancy, if you like, to think about what a stately home was. So it's thinking, what is the meaning of a stately home today? How is it? How are you going to make sense of it? How are you going to make people love it? Why do you want, why should people care? So it's those questions around which we've tried to turn a business. And because the um, guidebook for Highclere had run out and my parents law had done it 15 years earlier, to save money, I said to my husband, why didn't I write the next guidebook? So I did, I didn't know what a big job it was. <laughs> So um, I used to start uh, writing after I put my little son, who's a baby, and my stepchildren to bed. So I used to start at nine o'clock at night, but by quarter to 10, I usually needed a glass of wine. So the last half an hour was, I had to go back and rewrite the next evening. And so I proceeded on really. So the last half an hour was a little more creative than the, the beginning. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, but you know what? You just, every single evening, you know, I'd try and start after I'd kind of washed up supper and kept going. But it was the most brilliant, a great job for any Chatelaine because I, you know, I read all the biographies on Van Dyck or Reynolds or the major painters that we have in the house. Read, obviously, biographies of Charles Barry, of Cape Lucy Brown. So you begin to build up your knowledge for going forwards. And then from that, you're condensing it down, usually to a photograph and 
two or three lines, but that's fine. You've got the underneath knowledge, yeah. which you can then pull out as and when needed. Yeah, I love that. I love that you use the word chatelaine now. So <laughs> it's not a word. Yeah, you I think that's what. Yeah, it's. I think it's a good word. It is. It is. <laughs> what What would you say was the the most rewarding? project renovation project that you had to do at high clear but on the other hand what was the most challenging well with Jordi and i started with the roof in 2002 three because if you don't have a roof there's no point doing anything inside so that's not necessarily rewarding that it's not exciting like choosing curtains but it is rewarding because with no roof you can't keep the inside walls straight so we we began to sort out areas of the roof. And again, I've always broken things down into segments because there's no excuse not to start something because you can't do it all. You merely need to create a segment and part of it. And then you tackle that section. So I've always broken down projects into, into smaller steps. And then amazingly, as you've gone on, you've ended up doing quite a lot of it. Yeah. I love that because for myself as well, when I, when I have a project or even just doing something around the house, you always make sure, okay, if I know I'm going to start here, I can move on. Some people just jumble all over the place, but you, you need a plan. Definitely. Well, you just need to start. I mean, it's like, if you don't start, you've then got a roof where, where it's so frighteningly large that you, you, you can't fix it. So you can fix things if you start. It's yeah. just starting. Yeah. So back to back to Downton, you know, as a filmmaker myself, I know how much of a challenge it is to plan and get everything in order logistically. It must have been a mammoth task to to coordinate shooting days for Downton at High Clear. Were you involved in that? Well, we're involved in the diary side of it and what they're doing, and where they're going. You know, there's a great um, Carnival NBC are the you know, the production company, and they do an amazing logistical job because there's a cast of 18 key characters who were here on and off from February to July when they were filming the series. And then the film is just two months, two and a bit months filming. That's slightly different, but that is a really interesting challenge turning that all around. And, you know, we were trying to second guess what they might need and when they might need it in my planning and preparation hat on. <laughs> so, but I've got, a, there's a, we have an amazing castle manager, John Gundil. So he and I work quite closely together doing all the diaries and sit on top of that. So we've got a really, a longer view. And then it also allows us to, um, also for our visitors who are planning days much further ahead, particularly in today's world. And maybe people don't want to challenge so much now, but doing the, or travel so much now, but in the autumn, or they're combining it with a cruise or something like that. If we can look a little bit further ahead, it helps people. And I think to have something to look forward to is key, key to that little word of hope. Yeah. Were there any, were there any rooms that were off limits? Oh yeah, yeah. There's lots, <laughs> but you know, you draw a contract, there's 250 to 300 rooms. So we decided, you know, what we were doing and which state rooms they were going, they, we, it was a mutual collaboration and agreement, it always is. And what passageways, equally well, just because it's off limits, doesn't mean that if it works and we can work together, they can use something. I don't mind at all. You know, the room, the bedroom where um, William died in the second series is on the top floor and very welcome. I was halfway through decorating it. They used it in the halfway decorating stage. Um, there's quite a few rooms which they wanted to, to borrow or they made them look like other houses or sets, that's fine. Or they used the gardens, pretended they were Maggie Smith Dower House gardens. <laughs> so there was lots of film magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you saw you saw parts of parts of High Clear on, on the show and in the movie where you were going, where is that? That looks quite different. 
No, because I was standing, you know, you watched them do it. So I, I knew what they would do. But it's interesting, the transposition from what you know to what you see is quite fun. Or you see somebody going through a green baize door, which is just over there. But of course, they then go down the stairs, which are ours. But then the bottom half of the stairs are not ours. They're eating studios. And they end up in Mrs. Patmore's kitchen, which is not ours, it's theirs. So I love those trans transpositions from one set to another. It's fun. Yeah, I'm sure. Magic. We all got magic. <laughs> you, as we mentioned, you you have uh, the two the two books published about the history um, of two amazing women from from High Clear. Um, we have Lady Almina, and then the second one on Lady Catherine. Um, where do you get your your inspiration from for writing these books? And what a what deadline! Do you next. It's just a deadline. <laughs> you agree something, you have to write it. So that's that. But then I wrote at home at Highclere because I wanted to, because there's so much history here, there's been a home here for 1200 years. I can't always share all of that in one book, although my next book is trying to do that. So at home at Highclere, I wanted to share four amazing weekends because I could then spread the weekends from Victorian times, royalty politicians, statesmen, musicians. So that was quite a fun one to write and a beautiful coffee table book because I wanted to share through the photographs some of the beautiful backdrops, the wallpapers at Highclere. And then I did Christmas at Highclere because we all need Christmas every year. And I just think people have spent Christmas here since at least 800 AD. So I began with the story of a traveler coming through the trees to come here to spend December here at Highclere and to go into the old medieval, there was, was a very Anglo-Saxon hall here then. So that was, that was quite fun. So I, I, I enjoy, I write books from, they're normally quite hard to um, categorize on a bookshelf. At Home is about cooking, entertainment. It's about the heart of life, you know, which, which is a home. So it's quite hard to place. And Christmas I have, I really enjoyed writing that and it's given people much pleasure. And some of the recipes in that are, are really um, are kind of my recipes that my mother would cook as we came back in from the kitchen corner, straightforward dishes, which I've much enjoyed. So yeah, it's um, anyway, it's called a deadline. <laughs> I've got another deadline, so I'm writing. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But um, Lady Almina, she was she was the wife of the very famous Lord Carnarvon. She was. Um, and as we know, Lord Carnarvon supported Howard Carter for not just the search of Tutankhamun's tomb, but also many other digs around Egypt. But if I am correct, is it is it Lady Almina who was who was holding on to the? She was in charge of the the finances. No, no, not at all. Almina was an heiress within her own right, so she could do whatever she wanted. Um, her husband had inherited two estates in the West Country, some big estates in the Midlands, um, 13 Barclays Square. So he wasn't necessarily um, poor at all, but he was usually short of something called cash, but he'd married one of the heiresses of the time yeah. And her dowry was five hundred thousand pounds, about fifty million pounds in today's terms in cash. So, if there's any reason we're still here, it's because of Almina. So, uh, but it meant in some ways that because she was, um, she had su sufficient independent funding, Lord Carnarvon could pursue his own interests, <laughs> and he could spend his money on himself. <laughs> so, it was a great position to be in. So that's. He then financed digs. He first went out to Egypt in 1898. He then, because of his car crashes and ill health, he then decided to spend the winters in Egypt from 1906. He organized a concession because he didn't like doing nothing. He was a very inquisitive, um, a driven man in some ways. So he organized a concession for himself in the Valley of the Nobles and he found after a whole three months, a mummified cat coffin, which was quite large, went back the following year and found the tomb of Tetiki, who was the mayor. And then um, Gaston Maspero, the French Minister of Antiquities, thought that he was obviously serious and interested, so introduced him to Howard Carter. Yeah. He then employed Howard Carter, and they became colleagues and friends for the next 16 years. 
and they would spend the summers over here and then return to spend three months in Egypt every year. So um, Lord Carnarvon's own money was able to finance sort of five excavation projects at any one time in the Valley of the Nobles, the Valley of the Queens. They did a lot of work underneath Queen Hatshepsut's temple. Yes. And then in 1914, Lord Carnarvon applied for the concession to the Valley of the Kings, which he was awarded. He was a very good photographer, one of the president of the camera club, one of the best photographers in England at that time. He employed the best people to record, to analyze, to comment on whatever he had found. And then he published the books and shared it. So with that background and that dedication, that's why he was awarded the concession. Then of course, for the outbreak of the First World War, that had to fall into abeyance until the end of the First World War. And the world has changed a little bit by then, but he, the first place he wanted to return to when he could was, was the Valley of the Kings and Egypt. Yeah. So he was an extraordinary man, um, fluent in French and German, very well read, co fantastic collection of books, great traveler. He had his own yacht to explore the world and see the pageantry of other cultures with his own eyes. Um, it was called, what was it called? Aphrodite, his yacht. Aphrodite. Oh, that's that's a very good name. His father had a yacht called Mercia. So he no, he was a very good sailor. So, you know, there's, there was no um, social media. So on a boat, what you do, you read. So yeah. he was regarded as very well read and very well traveled and obviously a member of the House of Lords. And he was turned to for his views if he had visited or knowledge of other countries. So um, very good sportsman, very good golfer quite an interesting man, but at all times troubled by terrible ill health and headaches and broken jaws and lungs from earlier accidents. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for, for us Egyptologists, the names um, Carnarvon and Carter, they're always going to, to, to be there in our, in our conversations and when we think about great discoveries. Um, and you know, the, the, the discovery of, of uh, King Tut's tomb, um, you actually published a, a book um, on the discovery and all the details about that. But why do you think that the discovery of Tutankhamun was such a sensation? Well, I wrote a little book called Carnarvon and Carter to go along with the O2 exhibition. And when we created our own exhibition here at Highclere, and then I did another one called Egypt at Highclere. So I've just done two short sort of little illustrated books about it because it is it is the most extraordinary discovery and the first global world media event and it propelled Lord Carnarvon and Highclere to the front of every newspaper in 1922 more so obviously than Howard Carter at that time so it was very interesting to go back to me to as an outsider who'd married the current Lord Carnarvon to just try to understand it a little bit. And I think it's best seen sometimes in the aftermath of World War I, that you've got this glitter, this glint of gold from an ancient civilization, which survived for some 5,000 years, which was, which was sort of shrouded in treasure and myth and legend, works of art and architecture such as the pyramids. So it, it sort of transports us in every way. And it was a, two maverick men actually who discovered it and who were then trying to work out how to control the interest and share what they had found. So and my next, one of my next books is the first ever biography of the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. No one's ever written about it. So I'm crea I've created a room to begin to gather lots of the papers and stories in it, to write and explore the story of this rather extraordinary man and who in the end, he died because of it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, we, we owe a lot to, to Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. Um, it's also, it's propelled Egyptology forward, I feel. Definitely. Well, there's so much knowledge gained from the contents of the tomb, from the everyday life, from the 139 walking sticks to the to the garlic to the to the things that they might have eaten the games they've played all the different things like that was it's just 
opened a window and a glimpse back in time for some 3,000 years. And, and then Lord Carnarvon was brought back here and buried in the middle of an Iron Age fort, looking down over the castle. And the fort, of course, dates to the same age or era as that of the tomb of Tutankhamun. And it in itself is a monumental place. It's amazing. And there are, there are many uh, ancient Egyptian artifacts at Highclere, um, you know, going from sarcophagi, shabtis. Um, one of my favorites that I've seen is the alabaster vase of Ramses II. What is your favorite piece in the Egyptian collection at Highclere? Well, that's a really, really hard question, and I'm never quite sure. Just to clarify that Lord Carnarvon probably had one of the most outstanding collections of Egyptology ever put together in the world. It was sold to pay death duties after his death, and 1,400 items are now in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. What was left at Highclere was the remains, which was um, of, of the catalogue, which was not in, in Howard Carter's view worth cataloging and it was just stuffed in cupboards so they have obviously <laughs> they are amazing works of art and we're so lucky that I they were just we've put away we've changed our opinion on a lot of uh, those older ways of looking at artifacts <laughs> they have but you know it was i think it was the um, richness of the collection was extraordinary and Lord Carnarvon's eye for what was beautiful was outstanding. So what we have left are really interesting pieces. Um, there's a, funny enough, Geordie and I have also acquired from Bonhams a beautiful skiss dish, which is, I suppose, like a normal supper plate today. And it's about 5,000 years old. And it's so beautiful, so smooth, so perfect and it's so extraordinary to hold it before you put it in the cabinet. That's one thing I love because it's something that George and I have added to the collection, but equally well, there's an archer's wrist guard, which is a leather wrist guard, which should fit it over here when you were drawing a bow and it's beautifully engraved. You can see it better on camera than, than actually in the, um, uh, where it sits in one of the cabinets. That's, I think it's the um, the many different um, works of art that we've got. I mean, I love the, well, I think it's quite interesting or quite slightly spooky that there's a big terracotta pot in which were found a whole um, lot of silver bracelets. Wow. And they were buried in Tel Al Balamun in the Delta, obviously by somebody who was worried that there was some invading forces or someone was coming in. So they were buried in the mud there, which is a Delta city of the past and uh, where Lord Carnarvon had decided to work. Um, and so now we have the pot still, which is in one cabinet and the bracelets in another. And you're sort of very aware that whoever owned them two and a half thousand years ago, 3000 years ago, never came back for them because they were clearly killed. So there are some things like that, which I found slightly disconcerting. I'm not really quite sure what the word is. The human side. Yeah. You feel a bit uncomfortable, but perhaps, you know, with every work of art, they survive and we don't. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was the Egyptians, uh, their wish was that uh, they can live on through their, through their statues. Well, this was just bracelets. It was wealth. So he buried it, hoping he could come back because it was, you know, part of what he owned, this guy, this guy. But um, the bracelets are amazing and they must be from the first century BC. So they are quite old. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just a few weeks ago, you did a, a very nice interactive project um, for some kids uh, for a, a homeschooling project, as many of the, the kids are currently homeschooling all around the world. Um, teaching them about Carter and Carnarvon. It, it must be thrilling to, to have that story still be so inspiring to, to people of all ages. It is. And, you know, well, we used to have 10, 15,000 school children around doing school trips outside the time we were open to the public. Sadly, that's all gone and it's gone for a little bit. So I thought this was a different way. And next Tuesday, the 16th, I'm going to go down and and do an Instagram post about going through into the tomb because that was the grand opening 
of the tomb with the Queen of the Belgians. So I thought that would be quite a fun thing to do. So my husband, current Lord Carnarvon, is going to put a hammer through a brick wall and go and find the gilded tomb. I just thought it was a way of, again, and I've got more leaflets to put up online. So I know people can't necessarily print them off, but I thought you could at least read them online and do the questions. Something to do, something to put, to um, encourage children to do something else. But some of my sisters have got young children under 11 living and living at home, homeschooling nightmare. And, you know, my sisters are working full time nightmare. It is a nightmare. And I ring them up and um, they're so upset they can hardly speak sometimes. So it is terribly stressful. Mm -hmm. So um, and I've said what I'm doing and they're sort of wailing, still me down the phone. I can't go. But anyway, you have to do something. So... So this is a present for Georgie and Penny. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, any new uh, projects coming out of High Care to do with homeschooling, I think it's going to be a, a great relief to a lot of parents around the world to have you help help out. Uh, well, I don't know. Well, they're there anyway for people to amuse or not. And the little questions and answers and word searches I reckon should occupy to and amuse them and interest them. They can write their name in hieroglyphs. Yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> but you, you have the, the wonderful, the, what, the beautiful exhibition at High Clear in the basement um, of replica pieces from, from Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, where do you guys source these, these replicas? Is it... Uh, no, that was quite a huge project, actually. And we started it again. This was all before Downton. We haven't really promoted it because you know, we can turn to that as we come towards the centenary when I want to create a book. I've got hundreds of beautiful photographs from Egypt of the time, which I think are of immense historic interest. So I want to move forwards to them. So we did it then and it took us a couple of years to commission them. Some were made in this country, um, some were made in Egypt. So it took us quite some time to organize and ship them all in yeah. and then, rebuild the cellars and make sure they were good and strong and they were no longer needed as the staff cellars that was something of the past so we thought it's very atmospheric you're going into the tomb and that sense of being there without glass around but being there exploring understanding having fun so it's been good it's it's still people say the most amazing things about it and 80% of the people who buy tickets to the castle or down to Navi end up in the cellars. So that's fantastic. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's a, he, they, Tut still has the, the draw card. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I searched for, for forever to find this replica mask. Um, and so I understand how difficult it is to find the pieces that look just right. What would yes. you say, what would you say is the the must-see piece of the, the Tut replica exhibition? Um, well, we had a skeleton made, it's not a real skeleton, which sits next door to the Rishi coffin. And I think that's a really interesting piece because you can both see the remains, which is a replica, obviously, it's not a real skeleton, of Tutankhamun, of where his knee might have been hurt or broken, of where they mummified the bandages of the of some of the jewels and the rings of eternity he took with him with his dagger. So it's a way of connecting you through from that moment of death and the mummification and the preparation from this world of transience into the eternal world of the resurrection, which was what lay before Tutankhamun and many other Egyptians if they, if they, you know, if their heart was lighter than the feather of truth and they'd done their best. In this world so and the wall paintings I love the wall paintings and I if I've got visitors down there and I can go and share them the story of the wall paintings and the story of the resurrection the life eternal that's a joy yeah I must say your your blogs and your podcasts as we mentioned before they are so interesting and fascinating getting an insight into the life of High Clear of Lady Carnarvon how how is it for you sharing your your life with the world well I, I i don't think of it in grandiose terms i just think of trying to share what i have so i think of it from that point of view and 
and wouldn't think of it from any other. So I, I don't really worry about it. And because I've got lots of sisters, we've always had to figure out how to share. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's a really good bring upbringing. Yeah. Did any of your sisters like have a, a special pair of jeans that you were like, I want to borrow those and they didn't want to lend them to you. So you had to learn how to share. Yeah. But it is, you all do. It's you're usually a jacket or something, which, you know, I would come back and find my sister walking out in, which was then <laughs> a major argument. <laughs> so as uh, one of my, my final questions, because this is, this has been such a, such a fascinating interview and so great getting to, to know you, Lady Carnarvon, and hearing your stories. One of my final questions, what is an average day like for Lady Holly, I, I don't really know. The moment in the winter, my day always begins with animals outside because maybe the horse's water troughs need breaking or the ice taking off or more hot water being poured in to melt the ice. So you, so they, so the animals need water, the animals need food. And then the dogs need a walk and I need a walk. So that's the first part of my day before any breakfast, which then my husband obviously needs as well. So I start outside, which is a really good place to begin every day. Some of my sisters have dogs and to start outside taking a dog for a walk is a, is a you know, how, how many, I've got too many dogs, but taking them all out is a joy. And every day for them is a good day. And that helps, I think, my mind and my spirit as they bark in excitement. Think, oh, my God, another puddle to jump in. So that's the best way to start a day. And actually, that's where I end the day. So at 10 o'clock at night, I love it. I pile on lots of thick coats and I and the dogs go out in the dark, whatever the weather, because they need to go out. And we wander across the flat fields because my sight's not as good as them. And again, you can look up at the stars moving through the night and Arcturus has changed place or the Great Bear has changed its position, North Pole Silver. And that is such an amazing way to help settle the soul before sleep. And I think we all spent much more of our ancestors, our ancestors spent much more time outside. So at least we can do that today at the beginning and the end of the day and just a little bit of exercise in the whole of the castle looking quite black and monolithic, but it's become a friend almost because of the night walks, actually going round and just kind of feeling its presence and feeling that we kind of get on all right. So, and then the middle of the day, like everybody else is full of business meetings, marketing meetings, doing things, emails, trying to write the usual, you know, a morass of things that tackle tackle the inbox every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making flapjacks with the chef in the kitchen, I saw that. That's fun. It's really good as well because you know what? And um, this week we're going to make some beetroot cured salmon on Thursday because I thought it's pink and it's red and it's very good for us salmon. And to, to cure it and make it with wrapped in, um, you know, shredded beetroot is so easy. And it makes you look as if you're really clever. It makes me look really clever when I'm not. And it just looks so pretty on a plate. So that's a fun thing to do. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do the next Thursday. And then tomorrow I'm going to find um, snowdrops, I thought. I passed a beautiful lot of snowdrops. I was going to go and look at what we how we were cutting the roses down. But actually the snowdrops have drawn me in. But plant snowdrops outside. Don't bring them inside. They're not supposed to be inside because there's a bit of bad luck. I don't want any bad luck. So keep them outside and admire them there. So it's fun, There's, it's the detail here. We've all got it, you know, you walk through a park, you walk along a road in London and you can still the sense of the cherry trees preparing to bud, which will give us such pleasure later on. Yeah. Oh, well, Lady Carnarvon, thank you so much for taking your time. It has been such a joy getting to, to know you better and uh, an honor for myself. Before I open up to, uh, we'll take a, about three or four questions from from the, the live audience. Yes. But before we end, I have a couple of quick fire questions for you. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay, okay. Favorite room at Highclear? The top of the tower. Did you hear Curtis? 
Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, it, we froze for a second there. <laughs> That's all right. Um, as a self-proclaimed bookworm, what are you currently reading? I'm reading books on um, walking, hiking, the illicit the world, nature books. I'm reading a lot of nature books. Favourite person? In I've always got about 10 books by my bed. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a bedside table, you can just stack the books. They're all around the floor. They don't work, they're everywhere. <laughs> Favourite person in history? Do you know, I quite like William of Wickham. Mm -hmm. Which guest that has visited Highclere has impressed you the most? I can't comment. <laughs> They're all special. Um, Favourite place that you have visited? Well, it's all about people for me. I've got some amazing friends who live in Umbria in Italy. And I love going and sitting there, looking out along the lavender and the olive trees, and then having um, fresh tomatoes with um, um, unpressed olive oil on top, very slowly, with a lovely glass of rosé wine, heaven. <laughs> A destination that you still wish to visit? India. Which Downton Abbey character do you relate to? Oh God, I, that, that's invidious. I can't possibly answer it. <laughs> and finally, the proudest moment of your life. I don't think I have the proudest moment. I'm. I'm really proud that I and my sisters love each other so much. I've got a wonderful husband and son and feel very grateful for every day. Perfect, perfect. Well, Lady Carnarvon, thank you so much again for taking the time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our, to our audience um, to see if uh, anyone has a question. I see Terry has raised her hand, so I'm going to allow Terry to go first. Hi, Lady Carnarvon. Hi, um, Terry. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet you uh, virtually. Thank um, you. My home is full with Downton Abbey DVDs and then the companion books and then the book on Lady Almina. Um, I obviously did not do my research well enough to realize that you had more books. So um, thank you for mentioning all those titles because my two, uh, TBR list has just grown immensely. <laughs> Um, I, I actually, I have a few questions, but I think I'm going to um, just ask you something that intrigues me because um, in Downton Abbey, they tell the story of the family that lived upstairs and then, you know, the, the staff that was an extension of the family who lived downstairs. So how is um, the staff that you have manning Highclere Castle um, different from what it would have been during the time of Downton Abbey? Well, during the time of Downton Abbey, the staff were much greater in number here. So in reality, the house has got 250 to 300 rooms. There were three butlers, 14 footmen, and there are about 60 indoor staff living at the back of the castle on the top floor. So it was a much bigger enterprise with sort of 250 families doing the Forty minutes. It's a very different world then. So in some ways, Downton Abbey reflects a slightly smaller element of it for those days. Currently, we do have a butlering team who also work as the banqueting team. But I think of them as a team. And we all, we are all friends. We are all a community. It's still my husband is always Lord Carnarvon, my lord. And um, Pat Withers, who paints here, you know, um, she's painted here for 60 years and we'd stop by because we met in the cars as we were passing each other as like ships. And, um, you know, she would lean across and say, good morning, my lord, good morning, my lady, and things like that. So that still goes on, but it's always been, if it's going to work, one of friendship, teamwork and community. And it's not upstairs, downstairs. It's just a team and we all play different roles. So that's how I think of it. We're always there for each other. We always look out for each other and it's a way of life. And it's quite a good way of life. And then I'm gonna be sneaky. I'm gonna be sneaky and I'm gonna 
ask you a second question. Uh, what is your favorite piece of art that is on display in Highclere? I, I love the variation of the rooms, the variation of what's inside Highclere, the variation of, of outside Terry. I, I, I don't really have favorites in some ways. Every day is a different day. And sometimes the light shining through one window is different from another day. And you remember how beautiful that is. So it's, I really, you know, in the in May with the bluebells, you just think walking, looking at the bluebells in a bluebell wood, you're the luckiest person on earth, but anybody else can look at them too. And everybody else should look at them. So I don't really have favorites in any of the rooms or anything else. It's just the, the enjoyment of another day. And that helps, I think, because this is a really tough lockdown here and I'm certainly finding it tough mentally. And I'm sure other people are as well, but it's just, again, trying to look out um, and enjoy looking at a snowdrop or something positive as we go through. And then we're such social animals, aren't we? So being denied what makes us people is so difficult but we're all of us whatever country we're in we're beginning to move towards the line of both vaccine and less infection and understanding the disease better so with all those three things we are very near the lines we have to hold our breath for a little bit longer and look for the small snowdrops <laughs> wow. thank you right. thank you so much terry thank you Lizzie. next question I have a question. I don't know how to raise my hand, though. Oh, hi, Marissa. Yes. <laughs> hi. I can go. Hi, there. hi everybody. Hi. Uh, thank you for your time, Lady Carnarvon. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to meet you. Um, my name is Marissa, and I'm a professional museum educator here in the States, in New York City, um, and I do mostly Egyptology, and I teach a lot about King Tut and the story of King Tut Ankhamun to children and adults. I've got my little King Tut pen right now. If you saw what I had, I actually dress up as him. Hearing you, I'm always trying to expand, improve, do better, um, have better presentations. So I'm trying to soak up any behind the scenes. And you mentioned, I didn't know that Lord Carnarvon was an excellent photographer. Where could I access um, his photos that I could use in, in my teaching? Also your Instagram account, if I just type in High Clear Castle, will I find you? Yeah. Your podcast? You will. So the podcast, the Lady Carnarvon's official podcast, Okay. And and particularly for teaching online, it's all about um, the, the Instagram is a, I hope, a really useful thing to share. And I'd really welcome if you were able to share it with other museums or people who were teaching it. So I've done, Absolutely. I did two or three um, Instagram little videos down in our real exhibition, which and on our on the front box of our website. I have put up some questions and answers and I'm about to upload another two leaflets, which are just fun and just different ways of doing things. And then on the 16th, next Tuesday, I thought I would go down and break through into the shrine room and see what I can find on Instagram again. So I'm, it's trying to inspire children, isn't it, with a love of history, that it's worthwhile following. And, and I love seeing their faces as they go through. And it, it is exciting. And then, you know, they were writing their names in hieroglyphs and things like that. So Lord Carnarvon is usually um, written off as the financier. That is far from the truth. It was his passion for Egypt from 1906. It was his commitment in terms of money. It was his knowledge and the work he did even before Howard Carter, but he was a generous man in spirit and shared it all. He had the money to draw in the best people of the time to help support him. And at the time of the discovery, he was the leader, if you like, of the discovery. In the aftermath, he died, so he got forgotten about. And then the first biography of Howard Carter was written in 1972, um, which it wasn't written till then, which is so sad and so wrong, but it was a very good one. But no one's ever written about Lord Carnarvon. In the um, archives, I found you know, photographic records of Egypt from 1910, and I've started scanning them. And then actually I was, I opened a drawer, I'd moved a desk into a room I wanted to work in. I opened the drawer, I found a little black photograph book 
full of pictures of Egypt and the Tomb of Tutankhamun. So I was so excited. I then went around lots of other desks looking <laughs> trolls, but I didn't find then I got bored of that. So I, I'm trying to collect all my archives in one room. I've scanned quite a few and I then need to process them. But in this challenge of the pandemic, I have been working so hard, Marissa, just to survive, for Heitler to survive, that I'm, you know, I'm writing from, you know, eight well, no, six o'clock till nine o'clock each evening, because I just don't have the time as we have less people working here. The house is the same size and there's still more work to do. So I have, I will gather myself together to begin to process some of the photographs. Egypt to Heitler and Carnarvon and Carter have got quite a lot of really good photographs in them. And Egypt to Heitler, we also ship out to America and there's Egyptian bundles as well. But if you email in, Sally in the gift shop could always put a watch together to send out and then you can always photocopies if you just email the office so I am passionate about um, in making history relevant and important and fun for children and I give talks all around America I did in the old world raising money usually for education in Florida for reading and writing so it's I've been to quite a few um, amazing states and that is usually the purpose and I would Obviously, in 1920, 2022, 1922, love to come back and really focus a little bit more in New York and around the Met. Um, and again, the focus would be to see how what we could raise money and support because not enough history is taught in the States, if I may be so bold as oh, to say I that. would love to help you with that. It would be a pleasure. That's what I, and I, I'm based right outside. I give tours at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, private tours. Um, so I would be, it would be an honor because you and I have the, you're a great educator. We have the exact same goals of education and your high clear sounds like it's on archeological excavation. You never know what you're going to find in a tour. No, I know. This has been so good to talk to you. It'd be great. Oh, I can't believe this is so exciting. Thank you. No, I, I felt that we have a, almost a duty to try and keep history alive with children. So I, I totally agree with you on that. And Lady Carmen, I was actually interviewed by Curtis last Friday. So I'm part of this interview series as well. Oh, great. So I, I've been in the hot seat before, like you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so I think we'll take, if we have time, uh, another question from the audience. So I'd like to... Uh, hi, Jill. I'd like to ask, yes, hi, hi, hi. I'd like to ask Lady Carnarvon whether there was anything unexpected discovered in, in the Fifth Earl's Egypt collection? Was there anything unexpected? I think I haven't really found everything I'm going to find is the answer. So ask me that in a couple of years. <laughs> well, actually, I need to bring the Egypt book out for autumn of, 1920, of 2022. So I, yes. I have, um, I'm going to really turn my head to that um, in the summer. I've got to finish my current book first. So, but you know what? Um, I'm lucky to be working, so that's good. <laughs> oh, uh, only just uh, briefly, the photographic uh, equipment, you say, uh, that uh, is, is it still in existence? I mean, those, in those days, it must have been wet plate. And the difficulties of using wet plate uh, uh, photography in Egypt must have been diabolical with the temperature and, and the dust and everything. Obviously, I imagine uh, Lord Carnarvon in those days would have had access to when film first came out to use in his cameras. But is that old photographic equipment still around or is it is there missing wonderful? We have, we have Lord Carnarvon's camera in the part of the exhibition and um, with the plates as well. I, it was an extraordinary feat. His photographs are absolutely extraordinary. Mm. You can blow them up to, you know, seven foot tall and they are spot on. And that's why he built Castle Carter for Howard Carter, the little house at the entrance to the Valley of the Kings, because at the back of the house, he built himself a dark room. That's what he needed. Mm -hmm. so that's one reason, one of the first things he did was build that house with a dark room. So many of the photographs of Egypt date from just after the completion of the house. The house was built of bricks, which was shipped out here by Lord Carnarvon to Egypt, but to a design which Howard Carter came up to keep them both cool. 
So it was very much a resting place for Lord Carnarvon. His wife, Almina, went out every single winter as well, but she preferred staying in the comfort of the Winter Palace. They shipped out masses of wine, chefs, they took over everything and had a, hadn't had a nice time. But that was, she, Almina was very much in love with her husband and remained by his side through all his archeological digs. It was a good marriage. It was a marriage which to start with, you'd wonder, was it going to work? So I began Almina on the steps of the church where they were going to get married thinking, I wonder what I would find. And then in a sense, I set off on that journey. And then again, with her successor, Catherine, I really enjoyed writing that book as well. Although I found the second book frightening because I thought people are going to find out I'm useless. So <laughs> you have all these thoughts as an author. And every time I write a book, I sort of dissolve into a puddle of, of panic <laughs> and, and then try and go forward. But again, with Catherine, I was thinking of her in her turn as a, as a beautiful young American woman standing on the steps of St. Margaret's Westminster. But I was thinking of her because I knew what was to come. I knew that she'd survived the First World War her family had as a youngster. And I knew what was coming in the Second World War. So you, it's quite hard sometimes to divorce oneself from the knowledge of what is coming. But so that's sort of a longer winded answer to a shorter question. So forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the, the great advantage, of course, of those early is that it's, it's fine grained silver. You can enlarge them because uh, in some ways, though, photography was very primitive. They, they used the most finest grained silver on those plates and you can enlarge them to such a huge extent which you can't do now. They are absolutely beautiful and also mm. Lord Carnarvon sometimes drove back from Egypt with Howard Carter because he collected cars so they would drive up to Italy taking photographs he picked up a 1912 Bugatti one year of course <laughs> we have none of these left <laughs> and he drove on he loved the car but again we've got records of some of his travels through Europe, which he stopped to take as well. Mm -hmm. So it is a it is a great collection of photographs, which I have not worked all my way through. I, I've done what I've needed to do to hit my deadlines, but there's more to do. And I have tried to explain the process of photography, such as you say, and I found it so complicated because today, you know, I just have my phone right. and I just go press. <laughs> And maybe I've missed some of it. On the other hand, I think you can capture more moments, but it was an art. So he was, he was one of the first color photographers as well. So we've got some early color photographs. And as I said, he was president of the camera club. He won, he put it various photographs into competitions and you know, was highly awarded. So he, and we have a dark room naturally here at the castle too. Although that's full of stuff rather than <laughs> the remains of photography. Quite an achievement in those days. Thank you. Pleasure. Lady Carnarvon, I cannot wait to, to see this book with all of uh, Lord Carnarvon's uh, Egypt photography and also his other travel photography. Yes, I can't hide them. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anyway, um, I'd get some volunteers to help with, you know, people then, like, do you know what? Doing. To start with, I don't know what I'm asking people to do. I have to finish my next book, which is coming to a deadline. So I, I'm feeling very nervous. And then I keep losing my internet because BT keep cutting me off. So I've got <laughs> the usual challenges just to like. Yeah. I'm sure and, um, then I can focus on that. And we're all, oh, thank you. We're all thank like, you, Marissa. We're all, well, you know, experienced. We're all professionals. We all know what to do and how to treat artifacts. <laughs> I collect them, I have everything here, so we, I'm, <laughs> Amazing. I myself. Well, the thing is, the, the discovery was a team effort. That's what's important. It brought in, you know, Lord Carnarvon asked um, Herbert Winlock from the Metropolitan to come over here. Herbert Winlock stayed at Highclere quite a lot of the time. Leonard Woolley from Oa stayed here. A great Egyptologist stayed here. So he brought everybody together sat them with good food and good wine. I love to do the same thing and then planned it together. So it was an international team who then Lord Carnarvon brought together to take to Egypt. That's again, I think a really important message which I want to put across. 
I'm with you. I'll help you. I'm your New York post. I'll be your New York. Thank you. That would be great. I will be back. <laughs> well, you know, Lady Carnarvon, um, I have a, a book published um, of my photography, a 520 page book. Um, wow. All, Egypto all Egyptology photography. So if ever you're feeling despondent about your photography book for Lord Carnarvon, give me a call. I'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And my mom is here. She wants to say hi. Hi there. Hi, Lady <laughs> Lovely to, to meet you. And I'm so, so glad you joined Curtis for this beautiful interview. And we are definitely going to be coming to Heike Castle to see it one day. Right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you here. Thank Look you. forward to seeing you all here. Yeah. It will happen again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very Good much coffee. indeed. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, ladies. I'm going back to my dogs and my snowdrops now. Yes. <laughs> go, go, Bye -bye. And, go and give your dogs oh, a Have a lovely day, Lady Carnarvon. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Thank you. All righty. I see Lady Carnarvon is online. Uh, oh, yeah, right. How are you today, Lady Carnarvon? I am fine, thank you. How are all of you? Oh, we are wonderful. Thank you so much for, for joining. Not yeah. at all. I, I um, love I love the blue that you're wearing today. <laughs> well, I know you're wearing blue. We clearly planned it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the weather, Lady Carnarvon. What's it like at the uh, high clear? Is it? It's, well, I've you... been out this morning for quite a good walk with the dogs, and it's trying to snow with tiny flakes, but it's not oh, really. Yeah. It's it's actually just really rather cold and overcast. And I have to say, I would rather be in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so would we all. <laughs> so that's that's the, the dream. I've been to Egypt quite a few times oh. for various press launches and I also helped um, Castle Carter and gave some of our photographs and everything else to that, which was the house that Lord Carnarvon built for Howard Carter in the road, in the, on the road to the Valley of the Kings. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, that is quite... It's it, when you go into it, it's, it sort of brings the atmosphere back. Really, You're, you you can transport yourself back to that age, going to in the 1900s. You can. Well, yeah. the bricks were shipped from here. We still have a few of them. Oh, wow! It was amazing visiting the 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 house there because um, you really do get a sense of of the history. And I believe there's a picture of Lord Carnarvon on a on a, on a deck chair. I think. Um, and I think there that, is, yes. That was taken. But he stayed there a lot. He built it because he found it convenient for himself as well as Howard Carter. It had a dark room at the back because Lord Carnarvon was an amazing photographer and he had nowhere to develop his photographs. So he, he had built the dark room behind and he found it a very convenient place from which to travel to the Valley of the King, but otherwise quite a lot further. Yeah. Interestingly, when I went into the dark room where the, the camera is, um, we were filming a documentary and uh, the, the cameras malfunctioned. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> New York. Yes. Hi, guys. It's early here, so I'm keeping my video off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it must Hi, be the middle of the night. Well, it's not that. It's six o'clock. My twins are going to get up soon anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm waking up with you guys. Mm. Thank you. It's 4 a.m. here in Colorado. Wow. Oh, wow. Certainly a widespread uh, group. All, all interested in Egyptology is amazing from all over the world. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, um, I spoke to Bethany Hughes a few days ago, Lady Carnarvon, and um, I mentioned that we were going to be doing an interview. So she, she popped back in the email and said, uh, say hi to Lady C for me. So I know she's such a nice woman. She and her husband have come and stayed with me here. They are, I just think they're magic. It's, I've really missed, uh, well, as we all have, the camaraderie. And I think this last lockdown in this country is becoming ever harder. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we all want those days where we can just go around and be normal again. Yes. <laughs> right. So, um, what I what I could ask could I ask everyone uh, in the meantime to mute themselves apart from myself? Yep. Right, right. Mute myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs>